Good morning and thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. If you are an Emory uh, University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we are excited to welcome Dr. Mehmet Akshay. Dr. Akshay received his medical degree from Marmara uh, University School of Medicine in Istanbul, Turkey. He then did an internship and residency at the St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he also served as the chief resident. He then completed fellowship in hematology, medical oncology at Baylor College of Medicine uh, Dan L. Duncan a Comprehensive Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, after that, Dr. Akshay joined us here at Emory uh, in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology as an assistant professor. He, he treats uh, gastrointestinal malignancies and has been focused on hepatocellular cancer. Since joining Emory, he has uh, had a remarkable impact on bringing uh, the uh, HCC program up and running. Uh, he has built a multidisciplinary clinic and established a very active uh, footprint in clinical research at Emory and nationally. Uh, I hope today we will hear a little bit more about uh, uh, what uh, new changes in hepatocellular carcinomas, but also about what Dr. Akshay uh, is doing at Emory and at Winship uh, to push uh, the field forward. Please uh, welcome Dr. Akshay. Thank you, Dr. El Reyes, for your kind introduction. And um, I'm excited to be here and giving this talk about hepatocellular carcinoma. My talk is about rapidly evolving landscape and future horizons in hepatocellular carcinoma treatment. These are my disclosures. In terms of overview of my talk, I will briefly mention about the epidemiology and pathophysiology of HCC. I will review the current, current treatment paradigm in HCC, and then I will talk about our multidisciplinary HCC program at Emory. Then I will review uh, the incorporation of effective novel therapies in earlier stages of HCC. I will discuss about first line and second line treatment options and I will review the opportunities uh, in order to improve the response rates. And I will talk about the challenges of the current treatment paradigm and landscape of HCC and of course opportunities. And then I will briefly talk about special HCC subgroups and potential treatment options there. With that, it is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma with child QB and recurrent hepatocellular carcinoma in post-transplant setting. HCC is the third leading cause of cancer-related mortality globally, and it is projected to be the third uh, cause of cancer-related death in the US by 2030. More than 90% of the cases occur in the setting of chronic liver disease, in the setting of cirrhosis, and main risk factors include hepatitis B, hepatitis C infections, and alcohol but non-alcohol steatohepatitis due to metabolic syndrome and diabetes is on the rise in the Western populations particularly. HCC uh, has been classified molecularly and in terms of immune classification in the recent years. And this particular classification I will talk about takes uh, into consideration a proliferation class and non-proliferation class. The proliferation class is usually caused by chronic hepatitis B infection and has poorly differentiation in the pathology review. We know hepatitis B integrates into host genome and induces insertion of mutagenesis and oncogene activation. And those patients uh, tend to have immune exhausted but also may also have immune active classes. The immune exhausted class usually has a um, tumor-associated macrophage class two in the uh, tumor microenvironment. And these tumors have high frequency of vascular invasion and high serum AFP levels. 
Non-proliferation class is usually caused by alcohol, hepatitis C, or NASH. And the immune um, excluded class is usually associated with CTNNB mutation, uh, which activates uh, the anti-beta-catenin pathway. And these tumors uh, are associated usually with low frequency of vascular invasion, and low serum AFP, and well to moderately differentiation, differentiated tumors in pathology review. We know hepatitis C induces chronic inflammation and oxidative stress that leads to mutations. Of course, there is also an immune active class in the non-proliferative class uh, as a subgroup that is associated with increased CD8 T cell infiltration in the tumor microenvironment. Um, the potentially actionable mutations in all HCC groups is about 25%, uh, but most common mutations, including third uh, promoter mutation, TP53 and CTNNB1, they are not currently tar uh, druggable at this moment. Most of the time, the molecular and immune classification correlates with the clinical outcomes of HCC. And HCC etiology also has some distinct therapy effect. The individual clinical trials so far did not necessarily reveal any uh, association between, between the underlying etiology and the response rates. This uh, particular study looked into a uh, preclinical study in addition to a meta-analysis of three randomized clinical trials uh, with more than 1,000 patients and about 707 patients received immune checkpoint inhibitor in those three trials. About um, half of, little more than half of those patients were uh, due to non-viral etiologies, mostly uh, NASH and alcohol. And although the entire population still derived benefit from immunotherapy, when, they, when the authors divided non-viral and viral uh, etiologies, there was more benefit with the viral etiologies and almost no benefit with the non-viral hepatitis, uh, non-viral HCC. And when uh, authors looked into H hepatitis C and hepatitis B separately, uh, the benefit was still there, but the non-viral HCC did not drive benefit. And NASH-induced HCC samples from patients with uh, anti-PD-1 antibody treatment showed that there was an accumulation of exhausted, non-conventionally activated CD8-positive PD-1-positive T cells in those tumors, both in the patient samples, but also in preclinical tumor models that were treated with anti-PD-1 antibody and also induced by NASH. So that, uh, that provides uh, some interesting findings and hypothesis generating findings uh, for future research. Two thirds of the patients present with advanced HCC, therefore we really need highly effective systemic therapies. It's a unique neoplasm, 90% of the cases with underlying cirrhosis and liver dysfunction. So it's quite challenging to uh, come up with treatment decisions in this challenging disease. Multidisciplinary care is extremely crucial and it, it requires incorporation of medical oncology with hepatology, transplant surgery, and interventional radiology for sure. At MRA, we do have a multidisciplinary liver tumor clinic, uh, which has included medical oncology uh, represented by me since July, 2018. Our team uh, includes Dr. Marty Sellers, who is a transplant uh, surgeon, uh, Dr. Rokara and Dr. Witt, transplant hepatologist, Ms. Gerarda Sanchez from interventional radiology, uh, mid-double, and then uh, Ms. Majid, who is our dedicated transplant and liver uh, tumor clinic coordinator. Our care model includes a health day clinic uh, on Wednesday afternoons with up to six patients seen by all of, all of the providers. And we do have real-time management discussions between the providers. And we discuss the cases in our uh, liver radiology conference on Friday mornings. This has uh, indeed increased the referrals to Emory. It increased our uh, footprint in the region and it has increased enrollment into clinical trials specific for HCC. And it also ignited several research projects as a, a combined effort of our team.
HCC uh, treatment at the present time could be looked into by utilizing Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Staging System, which I find very helpful in clinical practice for triaging the patients. It takes the tumor characteristics into consideration, but also takes patient characteristics and organ function and performance status. Very early stage and early stage HCC um, is usually managed by resection or ablation, depending on the underlying liver function and the cirrhosis or transplantation with really good outcomes. Intermediate stage HCC is defined as multinodular uh, HCC with good organ function and performance status traditionally treated by liver-directed therapy, but with the development of highly active systemic therapies with really good response rates, I think we're seeing more and more effort in terms of research efforts to incorporate those systemic therapies into intermediate stage uh -huh. HCC. At Emory, we do also have a particular focus on incorporating those systemic therapy options and novel options in intermediate stage HCC, which I will talk briefly in the next slides. Advanced HCC defined as portal, uh, portal invasion, lymph node positivity, and distant metastatic disease with organ function reasonable. Do have, uh, we do have several uh, first line, second line, and third line treatment options, uh, especially in the recent years. In the first line treatment, the median overall survival reaches to 19.2 months. The terminal stage HCC defined as poor organ function and liver function. The current recommendation is best supportive care with a median overall survival around three months. Resection is usually limited to early stage HCC per guidelines, as just we saw, and the recurrence rates are about 70% at five years, and 10 year survival rate is about 15%. In clinical practice, though, there are patients who do not fit into the criteria of early stage disease, but still offer. Uh, resection by downstaging with liver-directed therapies. And this was before highly active systemic therapies were available. And with those uh, downstaged salvage resections, the five-year survival rates range between 26 to 57 percent, depending on the characteristics of the tumors. Um, and we, we call those high-risk tumors because they do have higher risk of recurrence and shorter survival, even though they are downstage with liver directed therapies. And that underscores the need for systemic therapy options and lowering the risk of recurrence in those high risk HCC patients. This is an area of significant clinical need. The current treatment options, mostly oral multikinase inhibitors or checkpoint inhibitors with PD1 and CTLA4 antibody, they work on different aspects of the uh, tumor microenvironment. And Multikinase inhibitors do have immunomodulatory effects, which may increase and has been shown to increase the uh, response rates with the checkpoint inhibitors by working on different aspects of the tumor microenvironment. One of those pathways is, is certainly a VEGF pathway. Uh, it is one of the hallmarks of HCC along with chronic inflammation. And those two hallmarks are associated with CD8 T cell exhaustion in the tumor microenvironment, and this is partly uh, driven by VEGF pathway. And VEGF pathway contributes to immunosuppression via multiple mechanisms, and it inhibits the antigen presenting cells and effector cells in the tumor microenvironment, and um, it activates the suppressive elements in the tumor microenvironment, and those are Tregs myeloid derived suppressor cells and tumor associated macrophages. Based on this uh, preclinical rationale, there is an emerging uh, approach to uh, neoadjuvant therapy in HCC. So two of the trials that I would like to mention from literature in recent uh, year are perioperative nivolumab versus nivolumab plus nivolumab in resectable HCC. This includes six months of neoadjuvant therapy with either uh, arms, and that also includes up to two years of adjuvant therapy. Safety is the primary endpoint. 20 evaluable patients pr proceeded with resection at the time of report of this study by Dr. Kasseb. And out of those 20 patients who had resection, 25% pathological complete response rate uh, was reported 
and three of those were with combination and two of those was, were with single agent nivolumab. Another trial looked into multi-kinase inhibitor cabozantinib and nivolumab for eight weeks in a borderline resectable locally advanced HCC, and those were not upfront resectable, and those were multiple tumors with potential vascular invasion. Uh, a group from John Hopkins presented this uh, data of their 15 patients with a primary endpoint of feasibility. Out of those 15, uh, 12 patients underwent R0 resection, and 41% of those 12 patients had a major or complete pathological response, which is quite remarkable. And they also noted increased effector memory CD8 T cells and effector CD8 T cells in, in their uh, correlative analysis. And this was an abstract. So no, uh, we're waiting for the full publication. Our group, as I mentioned earlier, is also interested in exploring novel therapies in the neoadjuvant setting of HCC. And one of our efforts is exploring neoadjuvant regorafenib plus durvalumab in patients with high-risk HCC. And we defined high-risk HCC as uh, T1B, T2, or T3 tumors, large tumors, multiple tumors, and sometimes invading the vessel depending on the TNM staging. We came up with this definition after consultation with our colleagues in different disciplines, including surgery. This is a multi-institutional uh, study run through uh, Academic Community Cancer and Research United, or ACRU, uh, led by our group uh, at Emory. This trial includes 30 patients with a Simon II stage design. Primary endpoint is overall response rate. The secondary endpoints include rate of surgery, uh, rate of patients who undergo surgery, rate of pathological complete response, safety, tolerability, OS, and TFS. And this trial has paired tissue samples, pretreatment biopsy and also post-treatment biopsy for patients who don't undergo the surgery, and also surgical specimens who, in the patients who undergo resection. We are planning for a robust correlative analysis of the paired tissue samples and also <clears throat> paired uh, blood samples in the peripheral blood for immunological analysis. And we will be activating this study at MRA in early summer this year. Uh, and we're very excited about this study. And it will be conducted in four different other centers to ACU as well. Moving on to first-line systemic therapy paradigm in hepatocellular carcinoma in the advanced setting. SHARP trial provided um, that sorafenib improved overall survival compared to placebo in one-to-one -one randomization in this phase three trial and uh, resulted with approval of sorafenib as the first line and first approved systemic therapy option in advanced HCC. Results were, you know, uh, the SHARP trial included primarily uh, Western patient population. So on the right-hand side, uh, another parallel trial was conducted in Asia Pacific region with patients with more hepatitis B and Asian descent, and the benefit was confirmed in Asia Pacific trial. There was a decade of negative studies after sorafenib approvals, despite multiple efforts and multiple clinical trials. Lanvatinib is a multi-kinase inhibitor, which also works on VEGF pathway, but also on FGFR, RET, PDA, GF, and KIT inhibition. This study looked into uh, lanvatinib versus sorafenib in one-to-one -one randomization in a non-inferiority design. And uh, patients with main portal vein uh, invasion or tumors occupying more than 50% of the liver parenchyma were excluded. <clears throat> and this trial met the uh, primary endpoint of non-inferiority Therefore, lanvatinib was approved as a, another uh, first-line treatment option in advanced HCC. More recently, anti-PDL1 inhibitor atezolizumab and VEGF uh, inhibitor bevacizumab uh, were studied in Embray 150 study compared to serapenib in 2 to 1 randomization. This combination provided 27.3% overall response rate con compared to 11.9% with serapenib. It improved the median overall survival, progression-free survival. And in the updated uh, results of this study, the median overall survival reached to 19.2 months 
which is extremely good for hepatocellular carcinoma, which did not really have highly effective systemic therapies for years. Not every study was positive, unfortunately. PD-1 inhibitor nivolumab was compared to sorafenib in Checkmate 459 study in one-to-one -one randomization in advanced setting, previously untreated HCC. And this trial did not meet the primary endpoint, although there were patients who derived benefit in predefined subgroups. My approach to advanced HCC uh, in the first line setting depends on the patient characteristics and the details of those clinical trials, which led to approval of those three, 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 uh, three different agents. Uh, my first choice is atezolizumab and bevacizumab combination in an otherwise good performance status patient with good liver function, which is child A class and no uh, variceal bleeding in the last six months. And for patients who, has, who have varices, they need to have varices treated. And in those patients, I prefer to utilize a tezobev combination. Not every patient is eligible for this combination. Therefore, lenvatinib and sorafenib are still very viable options depending on the patient characteristics. Patients with child B7, which uh, is usually with worse liver function, or low albumin. Uh, these patients may benefit from sorafenib given the retrospective data suggesting benefit with sorafenib. And there is also another uh, clinical trial which supports the use of nivolumab in such patients in first and second line setting, which I will talk about in the next slides. And that could be another option as well. There are some emerging options. Uh, recent uh, phase two and phase one studies reported uh, reasonable oral response rates with nivolumab, cabozantin, plus minus etolumumab in first and second line setting, for example. Durvalumab and tremolumumab were studied in second line setting, reported 40 patient outcome with 25% response rate and 57.5% disease control rate. And lenvatinib pembrolizumab uh, was recently reported uh, first line trial of 104 patients in a phase two study single arm with 36% overall response rate and 88% disease control rate. There are some uh, pivotal clinical trials in the first line setting, including uh, Himalaya trial with durvalumab with and without tremolumab versus sorafenib, cosmic trial with cabozantinib, atezolizumab versus sorafenib. LEAP trial, lenvatinib plus Pembro versus lenvatinib plus placebo. We, we also participated in this trial at Emory. And Checkmate 9DW study with Nivo EP versus sorafenib for lenvatinib. These are first line trials with huge impact in clinical practice if they are positive and they will most likely upend and change the treatment paradigm and landscape for HCC in the coming year or two. Some other efforts are uh, evident in first-line treatment of HCC. Uh, epigenetic alterations are common in HCC and are associated with poor outcomes. EZH pathway is one of our focus with our group because it is associated with um, uh, negative outcomes in HCC when it is activated and inhibition of EZH pathway enhances natural killer cell mediated cytotoxicity again is HCC cell lines and preclinical data in HCC supports relevance of this pathway and relevance of inhibition of this pathway to improve um, tumor microenvironment. And in general, EZH pathway is associated with immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment because of its impact on the antigen presenting cells and also impact on the CDA T cell function and differentiation and natural killer cell function. We are working on a proposal with uh, EZH inhibition plus atezobev in the first line setting in a multi-institutional manner. Uh, and more to come on this trial, but uh, we are in the process of um, uh, discussions about this trial. In terms of second line systemic treatment for advanced HCC, uh, several options are available and uh, all those options are studied after uh, sorafenib. Regorafenib is a multi-kinase inhibitor which 
uh, targets VEGF pathway, but also other pathways like FGFR, BRAF, and TDGFR, was studied in sorafenib progressins specifically. Patients had to be progressed on sorafenib radiographically and tolerate the medication and then progress. And they were enrolled into regorafenib versus placebo in two to one randomization. And this trial uh, shown has shown that the uh, median overall survival was improved with an hazard ratio of 0.63. And it ended up with an approval of regorafenib in second line treatment of HCC. Cabozantinib is another uh, multi-kinase inhibitor, VEGF pathway inhibition, but also Axel and MET inhibition. Celestial trial studied cabozantinib as a single agent versus placebo in two to one randomization in patients with advanced HCC with up to two prior lines of therapy. And this study also improved overall survival and ended up with approval of cabozantinib in this setting. Ramisuramab is a pure VEGFR2 anti monoclonal antibody studied in REACH1 trial compared to placebo after failure of uh, sorafenib or intolerance of sorafenib, and it was a negative study, but it revealed that a pre-specified subgroup of patients with an AFP more than 400 derived benefit. So REACH2 study looked into this very question uh, post sorafenib AFP more than 400 HCC patients and improved uh, median overall survival. Therefore, it is an approved agent for um, HCC in the second line setting. It should be noted that this trial, REACH2, is the first positive phase three study conducted in a biomarker selected patient population in HCC. Anti-PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, were also studied in phase one, two studies, uh, single arm studies, and revealed uh, up to 20% objective response rate in those studies, ir irrespective of the underlying etiology and also PDL1 states. And they were both approved as single agents um, after um, sorafenib. Pembrolizumab was studied compared to placebo in the second line in Kino 240 study in one two to one randomization. And these were sorafenib progressive or intolerant patients. Uh, Multi institutional study, it was a negative study. It did not meet the primary endpoint, although there were patients who derived benefit again. And objective response rate was about 18%. But this was all in all a negative study. Nivolumab and ipilimumab anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 inhibitor was studied in a three-arm study in different dosing schema in patients with prior sorafenib. And it improved, it actually provided an overall response rate of 31% with a disease control rate of 49%. And arm A of this uh, regimen was approved by FDA for second-line treatment of advanced HCC. And the responses were, again, independent of the tumor uh, PDL1 expression, AFP levels, or etiology. My approach to second-line HCC treatment depends on which type of disease uh, modality we would like to explore. If uh, I want to explore TKI-based uh, approach, regorafenib and cabozantinib are really robust second-line agents. For immunotherapy-based options, nivo ep combination or NIVO or PEMBRO as second line are good options. And for patients with AFP more than 400, remesuramab is a viable option. Patients who have an advanced liver dysfunction with child B or beyond, mainly seven and eight, single agent nivolumab does have data to support it. And the third line uh, option could be capozantinib if it was not explored already in the second line setting. But none of those approaches are really explored uh, after the first, the current first line treatment regimen, which is atezolizumab and devosuzumab. And all those uh, options are after uh, sorafenib, or the clinical trials explored that question after sorafenib. And therefore, uh, post atezolizumab uh, treatment is a clinical area of unmet need. 
Anti-CTLA-4 plus PD-1 uh, post PD-1 blockade is an emerging uh, paradigm uh, in, in HCC treatment. There is emerging data supporting salvage CTLA-4 and PD-1 blockade post anti-PD-1 failure. And these are all retrospective studies uh, reporting response rates between 16 to 31 percent. And th that includes HCC melanoma, RCC, Merkel cell carcinoma, and there is also data for non-small cell lung cancer. There are some mechanistic differences between PD-1 blockade and CTLA-4 blockade. And this may lead to a, a activity with the combination upon PD-1 uh, blockade failure. And there is an ongoing uh, prospective study in melanoma. Given this preclinical and clinical data with this concept, we have developed a phase two study with nivolumab and ipilimumab in advanced HCC patients who progress clinically on first line atezolizumab regimen. This is again a multi-institutional study through a crew led by our group, which includes uh, prior exposure to atezolizumab regimen, and we exclude patients with rapid progression, meaning who progressed in the very first scans uh, with good organ function and no prior CTLA for antibody. It includes a uh, 40 patients, sample size, Simon two stage design. Overall response rate is the primary endpoint and secondary endpoints include safety tolerability, OSPFS and correlative analysis of TME. This trial um, has pre-treatment biopsy and on-treatment biopsy. Patients will undergo ET and NIVO combination for four cycles, then will continue nivolumab for 80 every four weeks till um, progression or intolerance or withdrawal of consent. And we are planning rigorous correlative analysis to understand this combination of the tumor microenvironment in peripheral blood. In addition to MRA, there are four other institutions that accrue uh, who will activate this study. We anticipate activation of this study towards uh, the fourth quarter of this year. I mentioned about some uh, special subgroups of HCC patients that includes patients with child 2B and beyond. All the clinical trials I mentioned and we have designed include patients with child 2A class with reasonable liver function. Nivolumab was studied in Checkmate 040 study in a separate arm in patients with B7 and B8. Uh, these were 49 patients who inclu which included seropenib naive or progressor. Response rate was about 10.2%, a modest response rate with a good disease control rate of 55.1%. It was well-tolerated treatment. Emory uh, also participated in this trial. And this becomes a viable treatment option in this subgroup of patients with advanced child abuse score because none of the other trials really address this question. So far, PD-1 and CTLA-4 antibody combination is not really looked into uh, this patient population in HCC, which could be an area of future research. Another special subgroup uh, of HCC patients is post-transplant recurrent HCC. Patients are usually offered transplant if they meet Milan criteria with a single tumor five centimeter or less, or two to three tumors three centimeter or less without vascular invasion. The five-year overall survival in those patients reach, reaches to 70% and 10-year survival reaches to 50%. Recurrence rates for patients who are within the Milan criteria are about 15%, but it can go to up to 25% depending on different reports. And post-transplant recurrence is usually extrahepatic. Up to 70% of patients develop extrahepatic metastasis. And that underscores the importance of effective systemic therapy options in this post-transplant recurrent HCC but none of the um, treatments that could be utilized in the clinical practice uh, were studied in a prospective manner in this patient population. Soropenib was the only uh, systemic agent for a decade. So a lot of the uh, retrospective studies reported the use of soropenib in post-transplant recurrent HCC. 
response rates uh, ranged um, up to 10%, but mostly single digits and median overall survival again in a wide range of uh, results. More than half of the patients had to dose reduce and up to half of the patients had to discontinue treatment because of intolerance. And newer multi-kinase inhibitors were also reported in retrospective studies in this patient population. Regorapenib was studied in 28 patients in a multi-institutional retrospective study after sorafenib uh, treatment and patients had to have progression after sorafenib. Response rate was about 10%. And lenvatinib was studied in a heterogeneous patient population of 64 from Asia, uh, which looked into patients who underwent surgical resection after recurrence, or sometimes sorafenib or regorafenib, and reported various response rates and uh, survival rates. And both regorafenib and sorafenib were actually associated with uh, increases in the immunosuppressant agents that the patients had to be on uh, in this setting. So, as I said, none of the clinical trials include the transplant patients. They are always excluded. So that's an area of unmet need. And with the newer agents, there, there is a role to explore newer agents in this uh, uh, patient population. At Emory, we have developed uh, another phase two clinical trial, which is going to examine lenvatinib in recurrent epithelial carcinoma after liver transplantation. This is also a multi-institutional study led by our group at Emory, which includes patients with prior autotrophic liver transplantation for curative intent with good organ function and performance status. It uh, there has to be a no prior systemic therapy with lenmatinib or another FDA approved systemic therapy for HCC. This is essentially a first line treatment uh, uh, clinical trial. It's a phase two study with Simon two stage design anticipated sample size is either 11 or 17, depending on the response in the first stage. It includes correlative blood samples uh, and restaging after eight weeks, another correlative blood sample, and uh, then continue lamotinib till progression. In summary, uh, HCC is a global health problem with poor prognosis. The landscape is rapidly changing and Probably in a year or two, it will be still a um, different discussion. There are remaining key questions in HCC management and there are ongoing efforts at Emory. Incorporating systemic therapy in intermediate stage HCC is a, uh, is a focus of our group and a remaining key question that we are trying to answer in a multi-institutional study. Improving response rates in the first line setting is still possible and there are opportunities in there and need for improvement as well. Therapy sequencing uh, and post immunotherapy treatment questions are unmet need. We do have a clinical trial with nivolumab and itolumumab, which will answer a key question after atezobab, I think. And post-transplant recurrent HCC and liver dysfunction groups are special HCC groups where there is a need to improve uh, available clinical trial data for clinical use. And we are going to answer one of those questions in the post-transplant recurrent HCC at Emory with a multi-institutional study, which will most likely activate in the fourth quarter of this year. With that, I would like to uh, conclude and uh, thank to my mentors, Dr. El Reyes, and Dr. Lezinski for their tremendous support and excellent mentorship. I would like to thank to Dr. Wu, Dr. Shaib, Dr. Alicia, and Dr. Diab for their support and contributions in our Emory GI Oncology team. I would like to thank to Dr. Bekai Saab from Mayo Clinic, who chairs our crew, who has been tremendous help to uh, design those studies in a multi-institutional manner. I would like to thank to Dr. Sellers, Dr. Vett, and Dr. Rokara, Ms. Sanchez, and Majid from our Emory Liver Tumor Clinic. And finally, I would like to thank to Dr. Sambol and Dr. Kasset from Mayo Clinic and MD Anderson, uh, our collaborators, for their support.
and I, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Etcher. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A and a feature located at the bottom of the screen. While we wait on questions, I wanted to let you know that next week's Grands Round will feature uh, Rahma Warsma uh, from the Mayo Clinic, who is presenting unconscious bias, how it hurts us and our patients. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, please visit the Winship Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. Thank you. Let's see if there's any questions. So, uh, uh, Mehmet, while we wait for uh, some uh, more questions, uh, there was recently some discussion about the role uh, of nivolumab in the second line setting uh, with the change in the FDA uh, recommendations. Uh, can you comment on how that impacts uh, the landscape in the second line setting in HCC? Sure. Thanks for this important question. And I think the uh, FDA uh, committee decided to vote against continuing the uh, approval of single agent nivolumab in the second line setting. And this was based on the uh, nivolumab versus seropinib clinical trial data that I just presented, which was essentially a negative study. And I think uh, it underscores the importance of identifying patients who really derive benefit from immunotherapy versus multi-kinase inhibitors. Um, and I think uh, there are a lot of work to be done to identify those patients, because even if that's a negative study, up to 18% response rate was reported with good disease control rate uh, in that study as well. So first of all, we really need to de determine those subgroup of patients with biomarker analysis or clinical uh, features and underlying ideologies. Who are those pa patients who would benefit from PD-1 blockade? And the second of all, if you are using atezolizumab and bevacizumab in the first line setting, I don't think people would want to use single agent nivolumab in the second line setting. So those are the key points uh, that uh, would, would need to be taken into consideration in clinical practice. But as you have seen, you know, even in the first line setting with child to B patients, there is data to support use of the single agent drug. So uh, although, uh, you know, it may eliminate nivolumab as an approved agent in the second line setting because of those reasons. There still could be patient populations who would benefit uh, from single agent nivolumab. But a lot more to be done in this space. Excellent. So uh, this is a good segue for the question brought up by Ned Waller. Uh, what blood biomarkers have been used to identify patients more likely to respond to immune therapy? I think it uh, doves into the discussion that you just gave about nivolumab nicely. Yes. So, so far, you know, the only biomarker really we have is AFP, and that is with ramisurumab, not with immunotherapy. There, there is no identified biomarkers uh, necessarily that would uh, predict uh, the response to uh, immunotherapy that I'm aware of. But th there are uh, studies looking into peripheral blood and understanding some of the, you know, stem-like stem uh, CD8 uh, T cells to understand if those are the patients who could benefit from checkpoint blockade. But so far, there is really no biomarker to predict response to um, checkpoint inhibition in HCC. Dr. Shin asks, uh, he says, a great talk. Any molecular markers to help to predict recurrence after transplant? So we know there are clinical markers, but maybe you start with those and then talk to us a little bit about any molecular markers. Yes. So, you know, AFP is one of the clinical markers that you could potentially follow up in those patients. And these patients, after transplant, would undergo surveillance scans as well as blood work especially if their AFP is elevated at the beginning. 
but there could be role for uh, you know circulating tumor uh, DNA and circulating tumor cells uh, that could be explored in a research setting. But we haven't seen that uh, becoming a you know a, becoming a standard in clinical practice so far. And those are that those remain investigational. Uh, Dr. Lazinski asks, uh, can you comment on how the antiangiogenic agents might work? Uh, is it really inhibiting blood vessel formation or via other immune modulation? So, great question. I think as a single agent, it definitely has relevance, VEGF uh, uh, inhibition and also, you know, suffocating the tumor and changing the tumor microenvironment as a single agent, VEGF inhibitor because we have seen that with multi-kinase inhibitors such as sorafenib or regorafenib, but there's also pure VEGF inhibitor, ramisuramab, which um, can work on the tumor in and itself as an anti-tumor agent. But in the combination setting, I think much of the benefit comes from um, the uh, immune modula modulation. Single agent, um, uh, bevacizumab, for example, was a negative study in the past in a phase two study in HCC, but when combined with atezolizumab, really achieved synergistic effects. So in combination, I think it comes from the synergistic and immunomodulatory effect. As a single agent, some it still has a single agent activity, mainly due to VEGF inhibition. Excellent. And the last question that's in the box, uh, can you comment a little bit more about HCV and HBV positive tumors? Are they more or less responsive to immune regimens? Great question. So all the clinical trials that reported included patients with viral hepatitis and other etiologies, and they did not necessarily, I think, dive into the details in their analysis. And their, retro, their you know, subgroup analysis suggested that patients derive benefit regardless of their ideology. But as you have seen in the meta-analysis that I just presented, when the three randomized clinical trials were looked at, I mean, in, in their subgroup analysis, there was a clear difference between viral uh, mediated HCC versus non-viral. And in fact, this study was supported by a preclinical analysis of the NASH-induced tumor models showing those T cells in the tumor microenvironment when NASH induces HCC are stunned and they don't really engage uh, when checkpoint inhibition is employed. So I think viral uh, HCC tumor microenvironment is definitely different than NASH induced HCC because that's an oxidative process. The other one is usually, as we've seen in hepatitis B, is a different proliferative process. So we will most likely see more on this in the upcoming clinical trial designs where patients are really divided into NASH-induced, alcohol-induced, and hepatitis-induced. So this will give us more clear answers. And I think given the emerging data, there seems to be a difference in, in the activity of checkpoint inhibitors in viral mediated HCC compared to non-viral etiologies. Uh, Dr. Nuka has a question for you. Uh, can you comment on exceptional responders with immune therapies and how it will help leverage this information to tailor treatments? To what regimens again? To tailor treatment. Like what can we learn from the exceptional responders to immune therapy? I to think the best information we can get from exceptional responders is analyzing their tumor microenvironment and defining a biomarker that is uh, common in those exceptional uh, responders. And that could be a viral etiology or that could be any other biomarker that suggests that those exceptional responders do have in common. Because we know that certain mutations are actually immune exclusive. Those mutations don't respond to immunotherapy at all in HCC like CTN and B1. And there has to be another common mutation or pathway or biomarker in exceptional responders, which should inform us to select those patients. Because again, 
identification of a biomarker in HCC that would help us understand who would respond to immunotherapy is a very, very high yield finding. It's a very critical thing to know. Okay. I have uh, one last question for you. Uh, can you tell us about your experience in the multidisciplinary clinic? It's more a clinical question rather than a research question. How has that multidisciplinary clinic worked? Uh, and has it been a positive clinical experience uh, in terms of patient care, as well as in terms of uh, uh, research enrollment to trials? Thanks for that question. Definitely for from a patient care and provider experience, this has been a remarkable experience. First of all, patients do really like to be seen by at least three different doctors and one nurse practitioner in one visit. And they do have a lot of answers in that clinic. Um, and having a surgeon, medical oncologist, IR representative, and hepatologist in the same clinic really solidifies the plan on real time. And patient satisfaction definitely improves and has improved with this. It also helps to um, identify our center as a referral center for HCC, specifically with a multidisciplinary tumor clinic. And it has increased the referrals that we get from the surrounding centers and other states as well. And um, this also has helped to boost research efforts. A lot of the projects that I presented are actually based on our multidisciplinary tumor clinic and has been a collaborative, co collaborative work. So it definitely ignited a lot of research ideas. And I mean, as a medical oncologist, how many times do I care patients with uh, post-transplant recurrent HCC? That doesn't happen a lot, but seeing those patients on a regular basis really propelled me to look into answers and I, I found no answers in that space. And that's why we are running a, a prospective clinical trial. So it has definitely ignited a lot of research ideas. And lastly, I didn't mention about it, but we have been doing uh, telemedicine with multidisciplinary liver tumor clinic. And we are seeing patients from rural areas uh, where they would otherwise not come to the clinic appointment because how could, come, how could they come for four different appointments if you see them on a separate day. So we see them in a telemedicine visit in multidisciplinary liver tumor clinic. And this has also been a very positive experience. Excellent. Uh, I see no other uh, questions in the chat or the Q&A. Thank you, Mehmet, for wonderful grand rounds. And thanks everybody for attending. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity. I really appreciate it.